Uh, so I'd like to say welcome and welcome back to many of you who have uh, been here on previous occasions and uh, follow more or less the, the same format as previously, if I can remember correctly. I'm going to begin with a, a discourse for maybe 45 minutes or so um, and then we can maybe have a short break and then a period of sitting meditation and then uh, I'll answer any questions or if there's anything you'd like to discuss or put me right about if I make any mistakes. Um, So the, the teachings of the Buddha are referred to in the Pali language by a number of um, <coughs> a number of well-known terms. One of them is ehipasiko, and ehipasiko is rather difficult to translate. And um, what you'd usually find in in um, English books is the come and see Dhamma or something of that of that nature. So the idea being that this is a teaching that invites you to um, come and take a look, um, <coughs> put it to the test, and uh, it's certainly not um, a teaching comprised of dogmas which you are required to believe in. But there are a number of propositions about the nature of human life, um, the nature of the good life, um, given the fact that our time here as human beings is limited, and as we don't know the extent of that limitation, then a question arises, what's the best way for us to spend the time that we do have? And so the Buddha um, has many suggestions um, with regards to that kind of question. Given um, an initial interest in spiritual development, where, where the Buddha does tend to be um, quite authoritative um, is in his explanation of various stages of spiritual life um, in the practice of meditation, very precise psychological um, definitions of um, particular experiences that meditator will, will go through, um, what enlightenment means um, not in a sort of hazy uh, kind of new age way but very um, particularly in terms of the um, psychological irrevocable psychological changes that take place when one reaches certain level of development or almost what we might call quantum leaps of consciousness so the um, within this path that the Buddha taught, which I, I often refer to as a, um, an education system rather than a belief system. Um, the Buddha goes into great detail um, as regards both those practices, both those, uh, those attitudes, values, um, perceptions, thoughts, that support and those which hinder the progress of the aspirant. And um, I think today I, I'm going to talk about um, a group of those. Now, if any of you have read any of the, of the Buddhist um, scriptures and um, the discourses 
you, you may well have noticed this um, um, particular style of teaching in which um, there are groups of two, groups of threes, groups of fours, groups of fives, and um, apart from its obvious role in facilitating memory, these groups are not um, randomly chosen, but in many cases there are very interesting and subtle links between the different members of a group, and uh, they are often what we may call them a holistic um, system of either of virtues or, or even of, of vices. Now one of, the, um, one of these groups of, of three um, consists of um, three negative qualities. Uh, one is called tanha, or in Thai tanha. One is called mana, and one is called ditti. So tanha is craving, and mana is conceit, and titi is views. So these are three, um, three mental qualities which retard the spiritual process, spiritual life. Um, so we've got retarding agents, retardation, something like that. Um, the first one is is the one that you probably have, have heard of, um, the Lord craving or dunha. Now, before going into too much detail um, on this, I think it's worth emphasizing this very important point that. Buddhism distinguishes between different kinds of desire using this basic um, <clears throat> standard of whether something is wholesome or unwholesome. The word wholesome or unwholesome is translation, again, excuse me if there's too much of these technical terms, but it is worth learning a few of these. There's kusala and akusala. Now, wholesome or kusala dhammas means those qualities which um, lead to freedom or at least a lessening of the power of negativity um, based around three kind of uh, poles of, of negativity which we um, sum summarize as greed, hatred and delusion. Okay. Unwholesome or akusala dhammas are those qualities which um, partake of and enhance, strengthen the power of those negative factors of greed, hatred and delusion. Greed, hatred and delusion are um, titles of uh, uh, clusters of, of mental states. So, um, hatred, for instance, uh, refers to the whole spectrum of negative um, energy. It includes um, even the slightest kinds of irritation and um, goes right up to the, um, the most extreme kind of rage and um, hatred. So, so this one word hatred here must be understood to be a blanket or an umbrella term for many, many, many different um, negative mental states. Similarly, greed um, covers a whole spectrum of mental states from the most subtle kind of movement towards something um, with a desire to grasp it or to, uh, to become one with it or to possess it right to the most extreme uh, forms of um, grasping or sexual desire or whatever. Um, delusion similarly 
covers all kinds of mental states which are characterized or, or exemplified by um, fuzziness, confusion, it includes things like uh, fear, anxiety, um, depression, and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll recap there for, and so that I'm not losing you. Two kinds of desire, and one kind of desire is unwholesome, that is to say, um, it is bound up irrevocably with and leads to an increase of the power of greed, hatred and delusion. The unwholesome kind of desire, sorry that, that was the unwholesome wasn't it, the wholesome, I'm getting mixed up myself now. So the wholesome is the one which leads to the decrease, gradual elimination, freedom from these negative qualities. Now the unwholesome kind of desire is what we call tanha. And the wholesome kind of desire has another, word, has another name which is not so well known and that is chanta or kusala chanta or dhamma chanta which means the will towards dhamma, the will towards truth, the will towards goodness. So when it's uh, co- the Buddhist teachings are commonly summarized as um, life is suffering because of desire um, that, that is um, uh, so much of a condensation of the teaching that it, it's, it's positively, if that's, that's the right word, it's definitely misleading um, because um, the word suffering here is, is a very profound um, term which maybe I'll go into later on. But the word I want to um, focus on here is, is desire. And it, and it has to be made clear that it is the tanha or unwholesome form of desire here that is uh, referred to and not the wholesome kind of desire. If there's no wholesome kind of desire, then there's no spiritual life and there's no effort. Um, then you can just um, sort of vegetate and just put up with whatever happens as best you can. But the, the Buddhist teaching is very far from being a teaching of passivity. In fact, of, of the words, epithets, which the, the Buddha chose to define what he was teaching, he said, this is a teaching of effort. So it's a teaching of all the different religious teachings in India at that time. It was one which was distinguished by its emphasis on effort and the fact that human effort is possible and is efficacious. So this was in direct contrast or conflict with teachings that taught that uh, everything's preordained or, or that um, happiness and, and suffering is um, determined by a heavenly power, for instance. So the, the, the kind of desire which is the cause of suffering is the unwholesome kind of desire called tanha. The other kind of desire is not to be abandoned, quite the contrary, it's to be adopted and made much of. Indeed, in the efforts to um, let go of, to abandon this unwholesome kind of desire, one very skillful uh, one skillful means to be adopted is to boost and to encourage the wholesome desire. So it's like channeling this this energy from the unwholesome channel into the wholesome channel. Mm. Now, craving um, is uh, inseparable from ignorance. So this is a, again one of the, um, the the basic most important propositions that the Buddha made he said that we don't really understand ourselves or the world that we live in um, and of the various forms of misunderstanding which we're subject to the most important one is the assumption 
as a kind of basic premise of our existence of this independent self-existent entity uh, called me or I now with that um, fundamental mistake of consciousness of perception of thought then what immediately springs up is craving okay so craving is the desire which is inseparable from the lack of understanding or misunderstanding of what who we are what life's all about so that's that's the bad news and the good news is that um, it's something that we can eradicate um, because if we develop a clear direct understanding of the way things are then the foundation for that kind of desire is removed so craving is um, divided usually there are, there are different ways of doing this but three kinds of craving one is sensual craving another is the craving to become and the third is the craving to get rid of so the craving um, the sensual craving is the desire for forms, sounds, odors, tastes, touch, uh, uh, body sensations, and mental activity. Um, so we we want something um, to be happening all the time, and 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 this is um, based upon an idea that. We we grow that we uh, we benefit that we make uh, we make a gain through pleasant sensual experiences, and that somehow we are uh, made poorer by um, a lack of the pleasant sensual experiences or um, having to put up with experience unpleasant sensual experiences. Here I think you may be able to see that uh, relationship with ignorance that I spoke of just now is that, you know, why, why do you want that? Why, why is that, that movement, that impulsive, instinctive movement towards the sensory world, um, other than through the um, unspoken assumption that there is someone here who will benefit from it mm. so that that is is there actually this this being here um, who is um, enriched by sensual experience this is one of the things that we seek to um, explore in in meditation so we we want to um, have something going on and as pleasant as possible now when we crave something what tends to happen is that we um, value it we give value to the things we crave to the extent that um, people can say if I don't get that I don't want to live or someone who has some uh, heartbreak or something decides to kill themselves because they've given so much value to that relationship or to the feelings that they derive from that relationship that they feel that is the essence of who I am, my life and without it um, it's not worth being alive so this is the, the, um, the process by which we um, we value the things that we crave um, and that, that giving a um, unrealistic value to the things we crave um, is, is the essence of what in Buddhism is called attachment okay so we we want we desire and we feel we we need but the problem is that um, sensory experience 
is limited um, and we as this body and mind as the experiences of sensory pleasure are also limited as to say that no matter how pleasant an experience might be um, if you have it um, enough you're going to get bored with it um, and before you get bored you get used to it and so the initial buzz of um, experience cannot be sustained indefinitely you cannot go on um, enjoying something for very long and that's built into the nature of existence our, our nervous systems, our physical bodies can't sustain that kind of intense experience for very long at one time the um, the that which is providing the enjoyment is also um, unsustainable and a very common experience as I'm sure you know is that of um, diminishing returns that uh, in, in the course example of, of, of drug addiction for instance you find you have to keep increasing the dose of the drug uh, to get the same level of enjoyment so these are some of the the drawbacks or the um, the weaknesses of the search for happiness in the sensual world again I'd like to, to emphasize that the Buddha wasn't taking like a, sort of a Puritan stance against um, sensual pleasure um, but he was concerned that we should look at it very closely and ask ourselves does it really give us what we want it to um, because we may find that behind that desire for sensory pleasure there's actually a desire for a happiness which is unchanging and if we are indeed um, seeking a happiness which is unchanging through the pursuit of things that change all the time then we're going to um, finally end up with nothing more than frustration so um, the in in the last few years um, many of you may, may know the the subject of, of happiness has become very fashionable um, as a subject of scientific studies um, there are a number of um, very good books out there on this subject I can recommend one that was sent to me recently and, and won a, a prize in England called Stumbling on Happiness I don't know if anyone's read this book there's a lot of very interesting experiments in there but one of the um, one of the recurring results of, of these studies has found that an increase in wealth um, has a corresponding increase in happiness only with people who are um, in a state of, of fundamental insecurity meaning that they don't have um, <clears throat> the, the basics to sustain themselves physically they don't have um, enough food to eat or for their family they don't have a roof over their head they don't have clothing they don't have adequate clothing they don't have access to medical care when they're sick so in that, in that case certainly um, you give somebody um, ten dollars or a hundred dollars it's going to make um, an appreciable difference to their level of happiness but what's interesting is once you go beyond that level and someone um, has no um, rational need to worry about um, subsistence then the, an increase in wealth has less and less effect on one's happiness level to the extent that if, if we're talking larger sums of money say the difference between 
I don't know, half a million dollars, one million dollars, ten million, a hundred million, a thousand million, or Bill Gates, it's, it's hardly significant. It really makes no difference. And, and this is not some kind of um, spiritual teaching to, um, to, um, as, a, as a comfort.